During this year of training, Tundra was the first of the three to move the massive boulder. Zenitsu could not believe his eyes. Crying out in dismay, he called Tandro a monster for having accomplished such an absurd feat. Being surpassed like this really pissed the Nosuke off. By filling his mind with the power of tempura, and Nosuke, with a boar rush, eventually became the second one to do so. Hiding behind a tree, Zenitsu was losing his mind over how horrible this was. Now, he was the only one who hadn't completed the trial yet. But just then, to interrupt him came Zenitsu Sparrow Chuntaro holding a piece of paper in a panic. This confused Zenitsu, who recognized the document to be a letter of some sort. After that, Hanjiro and the others didn't see Zenitsu anywhere. The next day, when Hanjiro returned to the boulder, he was surprised to spot Zenitsu on top of it. He was quick to ask his friend if he had moved the boulder yet. Zenitsu's response was slower than usual. He admitted that no, he hadn't moved it yet. Tanjiro recognized his ship in Zenitsu's demeanor. He'd tell him that he would be moving on to his next training. But before going, he'd ask if Zenitsu was alright. He wasn't talking as much as usual, so Tanjiro was a bit worried. Zenitsu congratulated his friend on his accomplishment and ability to move on to the next phase. He even wished him good luck. Then, with his back still turned, he expressed that he'd simply achieved a clear understanding of what it is he should do, what he must do. Tanjiro's concern only mounted further as he wondered if something happened. Wanting to help, he began to say that if there was anything he could do, he was more than willing to. But Zenitsu would cut him off with pointed words. He told Tanjiro that he should do what he must. Tanjiro had never seen Zenitsu like this before. He was blustered and worried. Zenitsu was silent for a bit. He recognized how nice of a guy his friend was, and he would thank him for it. But facing forward with blood dripping from his forehead and a blank expression on his face, his final words would again be that this was something he absolutely must do. Sometime later, Buzon attacked Master Ubiyashiki's residence. There, the ailing master sacrificed the lives of his wife, daughters, and himself by blowing the trap litter to state up. Courted by all the strongest demon slayers emotionally closing in on him, Wuzan called upon the Infinity Castle, and they all fell in. Once inside, Zenitsu raced through the enclosure. He could hear something, something that let him know that his intended target must be nearby. As he continued his pursuit, he considered how unforgivable his enemy was. No matter what, there was no way that he would ever be able to forgive them. But once Zenitsu made it to a specific set of doors, he stopped completely. With his impeccable hearing, he was certain that the person he was looking for was just beyond them and beckoned them to show themselves. He wasn't interested in wasting any time here. As the door eerily creaked open, a sinister voice replied that this was no way to speak to them. They were his senior disciple after all. As the demon's elongated nails protruded from the doorway, they admit that Zenitsu looked a bit better than the last time they'd met. Now in full view, the blue-eyed Upper Moonstick's demon presented himself. According to him, despite appearing to be a little better, Sibitsu was still looking pretty shabby. It had been a while since their last encounter, so the demon extended a warm greeting while clutching his sword. Shinitsu, with an all-too-serious expression, said the name of the demon, Kaigaku. And now that he was a man-eating monster, Zenitsu no longer recognized him as his senior. At the same time, Lubiyashiki's surviving children took note of the fact that Zenitsu had engaged one of the Upper Moon Demons. Kagaku's words were littered with insults. He again mentioned how little Zenitsu had changed. As far as he could tell, Zenitsu was still a shabby, puny little runt. A total weakling. He questioned the boy's progress. He asked if the flare was a Hashira yet. When Zenitsu didn't respond, he continued to pester him. He questioned if Zenitsu could do anything besides the first form of thunder breathing yet. The way Kagaku spoke to him was no different from how he bullied him in the past. Zenitsu was unfazed, and his expression remained dark. From the looks of things, to Zenitsu, it seemed as though Kaigaku was pretty happy to have reached the absolute bottom of the upper ranks on account of simply filling in some empty positions. Kaigaku was taken aback by this. He was surprised and began to laugh. It looked like Zenitsu could actually talk back these days. Zenitsu's question was simple. He asked why Kaigaku had become a demon. Kaigaku continued to chuckle. He began to speak, but Zenitsu pointedly interrupted him. He followed up by asking why Kaigaku, the rightful successor of Thunder Breathing, had become a disgusting demon. Now, more angry than he had ever been, Zenitsu yelled at the monster. Because if he hadn't turned into a demon, their master wouldn't have killed himself. The man Zenitsu considered his grandfather 
the one who had taught him thunder breathing and changed his life forever, had taken his own life. The letters Anisu received during Hashira training detailed the tragic event. It's customary for a demon slaying master to do so in such an event to pay for the sins of their tutelage. Jigoro Kawajima, the former Thunder Hashira, had died all alone. Tears now flooded Zenitsu's eyes. When a person commits seppuku, someone is supposed to be there to cut off their head. Otherwise, they're left to suffer a long and agonizing death. The old man could have just as easily slit his own throat or punctured his heart, but he didn't. He had endured this tremendous suffering, all because a person he had entrusted the ways of thunder breathing to had become a wretched demon. Kaigaku being with a sickening pride and a lack of remorse, he didn't care in the slightest. He didn't see any reason to be bothered. He wondered if he was supposed to be sad or repent. Ultimately, he didn't care about anyone we felt did not value him. He was only interested in serving those who knew his value well and coveted it. In fact, with a smile not leaving his face, he was actually pleased to know that the old man had died such a painful death. From his perspective, he had worked so hard and done everything he could to please him, yet was never given a title of successor. Instead, the master spoke of making Gaigaku a joint successor with Zenitsu, a notion that utterly repulsed the demon. Their master may have been a Shira once, but Gaigaku admitted that he had no interest in or use for some senile old man. Infuriated beyond compare, Zenitsu clenched his fist while Gaigaku continued to boastfully laugh. Then, after a moment, Zenitsu chuckled to himself. He'd say that Gramps was not senile. If Zenitsu was scum, then Kaigaku was worse than that. He was trash. Pointing at the demon with a sadistic look on his face, he said he felt sorry for their master since he had such pathetic successors. He could only manage to perform the first form of thunder breathing, while Kaigaku could do everything except that one. Insistent of his own superiority, this is what finally set off Kaigaku's views, and he refused to be lumped in with a loser like Zenitsu. And with that, the battle would finally commence. Kaigaku released a horrifying discharge of black lightning thanks to Thunder Breathing's fourth form, Distant Thunder. Zenitsu prepared himself for the assault. The Upper Moon Demon lunged forward with his blade, but Zenitsu was already behind him while clutching onto his own. Kaigaku's eyes were wide with disbelief. Had that really just happened? Was this really Zenitsu? The Yellow Swordsman turned towards his target coldly. Too slow, trash. Just then, blood began to viciously spurt out from the demon's newfound wound. Looking over his shoulder with concern, Kaigatu could not believe that he had been cut. Zenitsu was unbelievably fast. Even without being asleep, Zenitsu's movements were uncanny. It was as if he was a totally different person. Zenitsu and Kaigaku, despite training under the same master, were very different from one another. Never once did they consider themselves to be equals. For Kaigaku, it was because he believed himself to be vastly superior, while for Zenitsu, it was because he saw himself as greatly inferior. But once they became full fledged demon slayers, Kaigaku took to solitude, while Zenitsu found his on time friends, Tandro and Inosuke. Well, now, they couldn't be further apart if they tried. Kaigaku thought back to the recent experience that had turned him into a demon. Seeing Upper Moon 1, Kokushibo, he refused to believe that it was shameful to kneel before someone with unfathomable strength. He lived by the philosophy that as long as you live, things will work out somehow. That until you die, you haven't yet lost. Kaigaku believed that it didn't matter if you were to rub your face in dirt, lose your home, drink muddy water, or be cursed by others for stealing money. As long as a person manages to live, they can still win someday. And it's that belief that allowed him to keep moving forward despite his sins. Filling his blood in front of the boy, Kokushibo questioned if Kaigaku wanted to become a demon for even greater strength. That if Muzan approves and recognizes him, he will become a member of their ranks. As Kokushibo poured his blood into Kaigaku's hands, he explained that to become a demon, the process takes longer if you are a strong swordsman. It took him three days, in fact. In order to turn someone who can use breathing styles into a demon, that person must receive a heavy healthing of Muzan's blood. And in some cases, there are some people whose constitution simply does not allow them to become a demon. But he wondered about Kaigaku. Once he was done providing, he would let it be known that the blood he had just given is incredibly precious. So much so that the boy mustn't spill even a single drop of it. Otherwise, he promised that Kaigaku's head would fall from his body like tears. At that very moment, the fear Kaigaku experienced was so overwhelming 
that it was as if all the cells in his entire body were screaming and crying in terror. Compared to the dread of Bat, Shizunitsu wasn't anything special, or he acknowledged that the Slayer must have gained some strength since they had last met. But there was no way that Zenitsu could ever beat an Upper Moon Demon like himself. Again, he reminded himself that Zenitsu Agatsuma was worthless. During their training, he was always crying and wailing. He lacked dignity or any perseverance. Kaigaku specifically remembered Zenitsu falling into a hole and spraining his leg during training. Then he thought of his disdain for their late master, who considered scum like Zenitsu comparable to him, and worthy of being a joint successor. Now viciously wielding his sword, Kagaku yelled out that it's only natural that Zenitsu should die. Him and the old man both. Another wretched use of thunder breathing occurred by way of its second form, lightning ball. With such close proximity, Zenitsu could tell that Kagaku had unleashed five successive attacks in just a single breath and had done so in the blink of an eye. As blood escaped from his cheek, Zenitsu shouted that Kagaku must have eaten so many people to achieve this level of strength. He wondered if the fool was already unable to differentiate between good and evil. So with a smile on his face, Kagaku retorted that he knew the difference very well. Leaping into the air now, he unleashed the third form of thunder breathing, Thunder Swarm. As he continued to attack the Demon Slayer, he replied that those who accurately evaluate and understand his words are good. Zenitsu's blood continued to spill as he endured the attacks. He recognized that this was a spinning wave form strike. Kaigaku continued, saying that those who have a low evaluation of him are evil. With Zenitsu now in the air, Kaigaku swung out wide with a massive strike of black lightning. This was the fifth form of thunder breathing, heat lightning. Zenitsu's eyes went wide as the lightning-shaped wounds began to appear over his face. He recalled the training he had shared with Kaigaku under their master, and how pitiful he was next to his senior. Kaigaku was overjoyed. He wondered how Zenitsu felt about the sharpness of his blade, infused with the power of his blood demon art. It was an attack that both slashes and burns flesh. Leaping into the air once more, Kaigaku ravaged Zenitsu's body with the power of thunder breathing sixth form, rumble and flash. Kaigaku further explained that any slashing attacks the fool takes will continue to rend his flesh. He promised that his power would burn into Zenitsu's eyes and body. He was certain that by becoming a demon, he had transcended thunder breathing itself. Zenitsu's body went crashing down to the infinite expanse of the castle. From there, Kaigaku boasted about being special. He was different from Zenitsu. He was nothing like Zenitsu at all. Zenitsu looked up at the demon plainly. He remembered the scolding words of their late master, that he should learn from Kaigaku's example, that he should be more like his senior apprentice. He then recalled a time when, while he was on his own as a demon slayer, he encountered two others that were bad-mouthing his senior. They said that in Thunder Breathing, the first form is the foundation for all the others, that if a slayer was unable to do that, how good could they really be? that even if they could do the others, they won't ever amount to much. Yet despite that, Kaigaku was stupidly arrogant. They'd say that Kaigaku would never become a Hashira, that he'd probably die soon. Hearing this, Zenitsu, the ever-fearful, actually struck his fellow Demon Slayer for these cruel words. When they met again on the road, Kaigaku, unaware that Zenitsu had done so in honor of him, looked at his junior with eyes of contempt. He had heard that Zenitsu hit a higher-ranking Slayer. With that, he swiftly told him not to cause problems. It was embarrassing enough that Zenitsu was even there at all. Now, Zenitsu could totally understand why Kaigaku hated him. After all, the feeling was mutual. He hated the guy too, but at the end of the day, he also respected him from the bottom of his heart. He knew how hard his senior worked. He was always looking at his back. He thought of when he had shared food with Kaigaku and their master. He truly believed that Kaigaku was special. To him and Gramps, Kaigaku was a precious and important person, but apparently that wasn't enough. Kaigaku was never satisfied. Zenitsu could hear it. It was as if the box in his heart had a hole in it, one that constantly had happiness spilling out, and that was something that a person needed to notice and close up. Otherwise, they would never be satisfied in life. With one last thought of their late master, Zenitsu expressed how sorry he was. Their paths had diverged. Zenitsu shipped in his momentum then. He slammed his feet onto the side of the unending wall. Kaigaku was shocked to see that the boy had any strength left at all. 
Despite his many wounds, Zenitsu steeled his resolve and internally apologized to Kaigaku. As in a single glorious jaunt, Zenitsu beheaded the demon with a draconic crackling, a thunder-breathing seventh form, Hono Ikazuchi no Kami. As his head escaped from the comfort of his shoulders, Kaigaku was in utter dismay and disbelief. Now, he too began to fall down the endless hole. As he watched Zenitsu fall above him, Kaigaku thought about how he couldn't see the attack at all, and he wondered what the attack was. It was unbelievably fast. It was a form of thunder breathing he didn't know at all. He questioned what technique Zenitsu had used to do this to him. The beheaded demon began to curse his own fate. He took this as confirmation that the old man had favored Zenitsu all along. He was certain that their master had only taught Zenitsu this incredible power while withholding it from him. But Zenitsu calmly corrected him. Gramps was not that sort of person at all. Really, this was his form. Zenitsu created it, so it was all his. It was one that he had designed with a dream of one day, fighting alongside Kaigaku as equals. The sounds of thunder now echoed from Zenitsu's chest. By then, Zenitsu had fallen unconscious while continuing to fall. He was dreaming of the fleeting times with the three of them, Kaigaku, their master, and himself, all lived together. Kaigaku thought of what Zenitsu had said. A seventh technique, thunder breathing, a six-form ancient sword art that had existed for hundreds of years, has been passed down from several legendary master. And Zenitsu, of all people, Zenitsu, was able to develop a seventh? Him? The same Zenitsu that could only ever use the first form? The filth that was always weaker than himself? Kaigaku could not stand it. He refused to accept his development. To have lost to such a pitiful creature, he felt like he was going insane with frustration. The shameful demon then convinced himself that he hadn't lost after all. Zenitsu was going to fall and die too. Zenitsu didn't have any strength left after that last attack. He was sure to die right along with him. But to suddenly interrupt this thought was Yushiro. Coldly, he'd express that someone who never gives to others will eventually become unable to receive anything from them as well. That only wanting is, in the end, the same as having nothing at all. And this was because such a person is incapable of creating anything. Now bringing his eyes close to the demons, he stated how much of a pity it was to die alone. Yushiro then left from point to point before grabbing hold of Zenitsu and bringing him to safety as a demon Kaigaku disintegrated into nothing. Yushiro had gotten Zenitsu to safety. As Zenitsu laid there on the brink of death, his spirit escaped to a land beyond where he saw something that made his eyes go wide. Separated by a lake surrounded by countless red spider lilies, Zenitsu cried out to his dearly departed master. In a panic, he profusely apologized to the man. In the end, he wasn't able to get along with Kaigaku. He had even written to the guy, but never received a reply. Tears welled up in his eyes. He explained that if it wasn't for him, Kaigaku might not have turned out the way he did. He was very sorry and begged for his master's forgiveness, but that wasn't all. He was sorry he couldn't repay his debt. He wanted to become a Hashira while his master was alive, but failed to do so. Again and again, he'd say how sorry he was. Not getting a response, he wondered if his gramps hated him now and begged him to say something. He tried to cross over to the other side, but the spire lilies wound themselves around his feet, barring him from doing so. The old man then called out his student's name. Zenitsu desperately awaited the man's words, with tears spilling from his eyes. The deceased cultivator let it be known how proud he was of the boys. To this, Zenitsu could do nothing but cry. In the present, Yushiro was putting his medical expertise to good use by bandaging Zenitsu. He was now surrounded by defending demon slayers. Murata, in particular, asked how Zenitsu was doing and if he could be saved. He cried out that he knew the guy. As tears escaped Zenitsu's eyes in the waking world, Murata continued, begging the man to save Zenitsu's life. Yushiro had been masquerading as a demon slayer and had even changed his eyes to be human-like. He wasn't a fan of how noisy Murata was being, so he told him to be quiet and just keep an eye out. This really pissed Murata off. He demanded to know Yushiro's rank. If he was lower than himself, he vowed to never forgive them. Being a demon, Yushiro didn't know the first thing about demon slayer ranks, so he ignored the question entirely. Instead, he mentioned how he was using a blood demon stick on Zenitsu, which was a sort of medicine developed by Karayo that Falfi had danced on a blood demon art. But as the flashes on Zenitsu's face don't stop, they'll open up all the way to his eyes, 
and destroy them. Then, while flapping a groaning Zenitsu in the face, he asked if the kid could hear him. Mm. Barata shouted at Yushiro, telling him to not say such scary things to an already weakened man. Yushiro replied, the bleeding wasn't stopping, and Murata demanded, let the medic stop it then. As Yushiro continued to bandage him, Murata cried out to Zenitsu with tears in his eyes that he would be all right. They were going to save him, so he mustn't die. The others would also cheer the Thunder Bird thereon, telling him not to die too. Deacon candidly, Yushiro explained to Zenitsu the upper moon he had faced off against was one that still had not mastered all his techniques and abilities. Zenitsu was incredibly fortunate. If the fight had occurred between them even one year later, Hagatu probably would have killed him on the spot. Now Murata was really mad. He demanded that Yushiro stop saying the surprising things. But thanks to that furious outcry, more demons had taken notice of them. Yushiro recognized Murata to be a pretty good target. Defending Zenitsu, Murata struggled against a hard neck and thinky demon. With a deep sigh, Yushiro told him to just kill the thing already, a comment that Murata was not happy to receive. As Yushiro leads Zenitsu up against a nearby wall, with the paper from his blood demon art attached to a crow, he realized something horrible. Two demon players were about to encounter an especially deadly demon. As elsewhere, the demon Akaza, Upper Moon 3, cross paths with Tanjiro and the water Ashira, Gyutomioka. So if you guys want a video of this fight, complete 50 likes on this video, and what's your thoughts on this? Let me know in the comment section. For more anime content, subscribe to the channel. That's it for today. Peace out.